Eastern on C-SPAN. Former NFL star Lynn Swan and the author of The South Beach Diet testified on Capitol Hill today about obesity in the U.S. The hearing's almost two hours. All right, ready to come to order. I want to welcome everybody to today's hearing. Uh, note the quorum is here. Uh, the hearing is on the federal government's role in fighting obesity in the United States. Today we'll examine the increasing threat obesity poses to all Americans, uh, what government is going to do to help people lead healthier lives, and how the public can provide greater health um, leadership uh, for the public as obesity will soon pass smoking as the number one avoidable cause of death among Americans, a reexamination of our national health policy is more than warranted. And Henry, it took us a long time to get together on a smoking bill, an FDA regulation. Maybe we can work on an obesity bill uh, once we get that through. The facts are, quite frankly, frightening. Obesity-related disease kills 400,000 Americans each year. Medical treatment of obesity and its more than two dozen associated conditions costs nearly $100 billion annually, according to some estimates, with about half paid by taxpayers through Medicare and Medicaid. In 2001, obesity was a primary factor in five of the six leading causes of death among Americans. Heart disease, cancer, stroke, chronic uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, and diabetes. One third of all Americans are considered obese. Another third are overweight, and the trend line is getting worse. Clearly, all Americans aren't eating wisely, they're not exercising enough, but that's too simple. The root causes of obesity are far too many in number to adequately address here today. We're a nation consumed by work, spending long hours behind desks, favoring fast food meals, and cramming in exercise when we're able, if at all. While heredity largely determines how a person burns calories and retains fat, a person's behavior unquestionably has a greater impact on weight gain. In the year 2000, women consumed 335 more calories per day than they ate in 1971. Men eat 168 more calories today than they did 30 years ago. At the same time, nearly half of all American adults report that they engage in no physical activity at all. During its meeting last week, the U.S. Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee declared that most adults need 30 minutes of moderate physical activity nearly every day, and some require 60 minutes a day to avoid weight gain. Yet, while there may be consensus that all Americans should be more physically active and make uh, better eating decisions, there are numerous and conflicting views on how to reach those goals. People are confused. Should they follow the same food pyramid we all learned in school a long time ago? Is the answer a low-carb or no-carb diet? How much daily exercise is enough to make a difference? Well, today's hearing will focus on how the government should and perhaps should not respond to the obesity epidemic. It's especially timely because several executive branch agencies and departments are reassessing their roles in the fight against obesity. For example, the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Agriculture are working together on revisions to the federal dietary guidelines and its well-known visual aid, the food pyramid. The Food and Drug Administration's Obesity Working Group released a report entitled, entitled Calories Count to Reexamine FDA's Responsibilities for Reducing Obesity. Also, HHS is overseeing the President's Healthier USA initiative to emphasize the importance of physical activity, a nutritious diet, and making smart health choices. All of these programs are thoughtful and well-intentioned steps in the fight against obesity. But as officials at all levels of government contemplate what message to convey, in an increasingly over, to an increasingly overweight U.S. population and how to convey it, the question we want to ask today are many and complex. What should government's role be in, in fighting obesity? If we agree the government should have a role in advocating healthy living, what should that role look like? To what degree should we act and at what cost to our pocketbooks and quality of life? Some favor significantly enhancing federal regulation of food, diet, and consumer choice. Proposals ranging from the Twinkie tax to federally mandated labeling of restaurant menus begs a larger debate on the appropriate role of government in our lives. So the question becomes, how do we reconcile the need for government to participate in the campaign against obesity without implying that Americans should be able to make decisions about what to eat and drink on their own? 
To help answer these questions, we have two panels of distinguished witnesses from the fields of government, academia, science, and law. I look forward to our discussion today, and I again want to welcome our witnesses and their important testimony. I'd like to ask unanimous consent that the written statement of Marshall Manson, Vice President of Public Affairs for the Center for Individual Freedom, be submitted for the record. And with that objection so ordered, I would now yield to Mr. Waxman for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing on obesity today. Obesity rates in the United States and abroad are rising at an alarming rate. And a key question is what can the government do to fight this epidemic? Well, I believe the government's role is to create opportunities for individuals and communities to address obesity. Americans need to access uh, meaningful nutritional information about uh, foods and effective messages about how to maintain healthy weight. Communities need safe places to exercise, inviting places to walk, and recreational opportunities so that the young and old can be active. Ultimately, of course, the decisions are going to be up to the individuals and communities. But let's get as much information, correct information, to people as possible. That's why I was pleased to have been the author of the Nutrition Labeling and, Labeling and Education Act, which provides the ingredient labeling information on every food product that uh, is available for sale. And it tells people about calories, carbohydrates, uh, uh, cholesterol, and other uh, ingredients. Many public policies on obesity make a difference. For example, HHS established the STEPS Cooperative Agreement Program to fund community-based programs that have been effective in um, controlling chronic illnesses associated with obesity. There are other cases, however, where government, especially under this Bush administration, uh, uh, the priority seemed to be promoting the interests of the food industry over uh, the protection of the public health. And I want to set out some examples of that. On this food labeling bill that I authored, the Nutritional Labeling and Education Act, the law provided that claims couldn't be made on food products about protecting people against disease unless there was a clear scientific consensus. Well, FDA now has re reinterpreted the law, and they decided that they're not going to enforce this legal requirement about a significant agreement, scientific agreement, before the companies can make the health claims about foods. And they're going to let the companies go out and make these claims because they now know that they won't be called to task by the FDA. And one of the first decisions under this new policy, FDA announced it would let companies claim that, quote, supportive but not conclusive research shows that eating 1.5 ounces per day of walnuts as part of a low saturated fat and low cholesterol diet and not resulting in increased caloric intake may reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means. There may be experts here today who can understand what this message means in just one reading, but for the rest of us, it's quite complex. Maybe what they expect the bottom line to be is that people should think that eating walnuts may prevent heart disease. But that conclusion doesn't have scientific agreement behind it, and it may be wrong. Well, FDA found all the studies submitted to support the claim to be either irrelevant or a poor to moderate scientific quality, and FDA's independent reviewers agreed it is uncertain from the publicity available, uh, publicly available scientific evidence that increasing consumption of walnuts will reduce coronary heart disease. So these claims, um, uh, this kind of claim for walnuts may help sell more walnuts. The manufacturers and those in the processing of walnuts can make some more money but I think it's misleading and confusing for consumers and undermines the intent of Congress in terms of giving accurate information to consumers. There's been a recent policy action on soft drinks that also exemplifies this administration's approach. The Department of Health and Human Services has repeatedly tried to block the World Health Organization from concluding that there is evidence linking sugar-containing beverages with weight gain. Well, this position may please the soft drink manufacturers, but it certainly contradicts the scientific opinion of the Surgeon General, the Centers for Disease Control, the United States Department of Agriculture, as well as the findings of a number of scientific studies. So, in effect, we have the administration 
putting the interests of the soft drink manufacturers over the scientific consensus that there is this link. On nutrition education, the Department of Agriculture decided that public campaigns funded through food stamp programs may not be used to convey negative written, visual, or verbal expressions about any specific foods, beverage, or commodities. The Department of Agriculture staff is, has uh, even given, been given the right to review the content of each educational campaign to ensure that there's no belittlement or derogation of food items. So this is a tweaky provision protection, uh, pro a provision that does not appear to have any scientific justification. The Department of Agriculture appears to be prohibiting states from saying anything bad about junk foods. This despite a recent study showing that junk foods constitute almost one-third of Americans' diets. So what we see, I think, is a troubling pattern emerging. When the manufacturer wants to make misleading health claims, the administration says yes. When public health agencies want to educate the public about well-established health risks of certain foods, the administration says no. Don't tell the consumers. Well, there's a lot at stake for food companies. As one investment uh, report concluded, any restrictions on advertising, more comprehensible labeling, warnings that clearly highlight the risk of overindulgence in, in snacks, soft drinks, and fast food can only be negative for the industries that sell those foodstuffs. However, the purpose of government is not to protect the short-term profits of the food industry. It is to support the health of individuals and communities. Ultimately, healthy eating will provide many opportunities for companies to provide and provide, provide and market foods. But we shouldn't uh, uh, try to keep the consumers from knowing the, the facts. I hope as we move forward on the battle against obesity, our health agencies will remember that obesity and overweight are public health issues with public health consequences. People need to be guided by the best science and must advance the goal of improving health. So I, I thank the witnesses. I look forward to hearing uh, what they have to say today as we try to think through what to do about what some are describing as an epidemic, particularly um, among our children. Well, thank you very much. Uh, members will have uh, uh, 10 days to make opening statements. Anybody really wish to make a Mr. statement? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Ms. Thank you. You have an introduction. I know Mr. Murphy has an introduction of panelists. So that'd be great. You recognize that. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Chairman Davis. I'd like to uh, congratulate you for your outstanding leadership uh, for holding this uh, timely hearing, and my good friend from California, Mr. Waxman, as well. I'd like to especially thank our, our one panelist for being here today because he's uh, one of my uh, congressional constituents, and that's uh, Dr. Arthur Agatston, who is uh, right there in the front row, and uh, he is going to be bringing his expertise to this uh, vital hearing. Dr. Agatston uh, will speak on the second panel, as you pointed out, uh, Mr. Chairman. And the doctor, as all of us know, is the author of the best-selling book, The South Beach Diet, the uh, best-selling lifestyle book that has been on the New York Times bestseller list now for over a year. Dr. Agatston uh, brings with him a, a wealth of experience providing the public with information about the connection between a good diet, safe weight loss, and disease prevention. He has authored more than 100 scientific uh, publications, as well as reviewed for major medical and cardiology journals. Uh, he's a cardiologist uh, with uh, Mount Sinai uh, Hospital uh, located in my congressional district in Miami Beach. And as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, America's obesity problem has reached a critical level. Obesity rates have increased dramatically over the past two decades, and the National Center for Health Statistics estimated that 64 percent of American adults were considered overweight or obese in the years 1990 and 2000 when they did the study. And the physical and economic cost of obesity are astounding. Obesity, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, will surpass smoking as the leading avoidable cause of death among Americans. It has been linked to, uh, as caused to diseases such as cancer, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, and illnesses that account for over two-thirds of all deaths in the United States. And since obesity is caused by multiple large-scale factors, no one solution will adequately help Americans control their weight. Nevertheless, the federal government is currently reexamining many of our health and nutrition policies, and I commend uh, your committee, Mr. Chairman, for examining 
these critical government initiatives. It's imperative to assess their impact on whether the federal government can or should do more. And I hope that we're going to continue uh, to work together to eradicate this disease. And thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for inviting uh, my congressional constituent, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Arthur Agatston, uh, to be a witness here today, who's joined by his wonderful powerhouse of a wife as well. Thank, thank you, you very Mr. much, Chairman. Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for convening this uh, hearing on this important uh, aspect for public health and one that uh, is really a killer of our Thank children and our adults. I would like to take a minute to recognize one of the witnesses testifying before us, Lynn Swan, who is Chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Uh, Lynn, a Pittsburgher now, although he's originally from Tennessee, I believe, and spent some time at a place called USC where he became an All-American, we still see as one of the best football players the game has ever seen. While with the Pittsburgh Steelers, number 88 played in four Super Bowl games in six years, was named MVP in Super Bowl 10, and is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And their website says, and I quote, he is blessed with gazelle-like speed, fluid movements, and a tremendous leaping ability, which caused him to become a regular wide receiver in his second year. But I digress. Gazelle. Huh? Gazelle-like. <laughs> All those years of ballet out there. However, football is not Lynn's only passion. Lynn also has a heart for helping people reach personal milestones physically, mentally, and emotionally. In addition to promoting healthy living through the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports, Lynn has also been the national spokesman is on the board of directors for the mentoring program Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. Lynn brings a lot of experience to the table. I'm glad he's able to be with us today to discuss the concerns of obesity and its impact on health in America. And it is because of this broad range of concerns, we recognize him as an all-American in every way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Townsend. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me also um, thank, you. thank you first for having the hearing and also to thank the witnesses for coming. Uh, we're here at a very crucial point in the stability of our country's health and well-being. And it is time to take a very hard look at what we, are, we plan to do to reverse this terrible trend. Our nation the lack of nutritional conscience is staggering. If we don't act now, our children and grandchildren are going to continue to eat poorly, exercise less, and suffer adverse health consequences, resulting in pre premature death and reduced quality of life. Americans are suffering from a multitude of preventable illnesses that are a direct result of bad eating habits and a sedentary lifestyle, which can lead to diabetes, heart disease, asthma, stroke, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis, pregnancy, complications, increased surgical risk, depression, and certain types of cancer are associated with obesity. Over 8 million <laughs> children and teenagers in the United States are overweight. Obesity is not just a vanity issue for adults, and it's time to confront that reality. Children have the immediate risk of type 2 diabetes, hypertension, orthopedic problems, and psychosocial implications such as discrimination, alienation, bullying. Moreover, obese children and adolescents are more likely to become obese adults. I direct your attention uh, to a, a graph on the easel. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we are here today. This is embarrassing. This chart shows precisely what we are talking about. We owe our children more than this. It's bad enough that we as adults are eating this way, but our kids don't deserve this. Take a long look at the numbers, over 20% our babies aged 19 to 24 months have never consumed any food except for soft drinks, bacon, and french fries. That is almost unbelievable. But ladies and gentlemen, it is true. We need to address the economic circumstances affecting food choice. Disadvantaged inner city families are surrounded by fast food restaurants and stores carrying snack foods with little nutritional value. Young Americans need to be able to exercise and play in safe parks and neighborhoods. They need to have access to regular physical education and schools that not only teach them, 
the three R's, but teach them nutrition and healthy choices. Employers must implement worksite healthy promotions programs that allow employees a small amount of time each day to participate in physical activity. Healthy food needs to be readily accessible to every citizen. We cannot afford to wait, Mr. Chairman, for our children, for our quality of life, we must act now. Failure to do so will result in a nation too overweight and too sick to sustain. Thank you again for having this hearing. I think the timing is right. Don't let me yield back. Thank you very much. Mr. Schrock. You've been Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't going to make any comments, but I think I'll make a brief opening statement, and then I have a couple comments on things I've heard here already. You know, current health debates are clearly focusing on health, uh, or, uh, on coverage, benefits, malpractice, and payment levels. But one of the most important health issues uh, cannot be overlooked, and of course, that is the actual health of the American people. And obesity in the U.S. population has been increasingly steady over the last two decades, and unfortunately, plays, plays a major role in. Uh, in uh, disability at all ages, and I'm delighted the Gazelle and others are here today to uh, discuss this with us. And until a few minutes ago, I thought I'd heard everything during the business meeting we were having and uh, some of the things I heard uh, President Bush being blamed for. I leaned to Mr. Putnam and said jokingly, before long, Mr. Bush will be blamed for the Civil War. Well, I'm not far off because a few minutes ago, now he's being blamed for obesity. How ridiculous does this get? What about personal responsibility? What about families taking control of the eating habits of their families and making sure that children stay home at night and eat and that dad doesn't stop by a fast food restaurant on the way home and pick up junk for them to eat? Now, that doesn't mean all fast food is junk because some of these people are getting their act together and there, there are healthier things in the fast food restaurants, but it it's boils down to personal responsibility. I go into um, middle schools and high schools and they're gee dunk machines. That's what we used to call them in the Navy. That's where they can sell Cokes or candy bars or chips. That's nonsense. If we really care about the kid, health of our kids, why are we allowing that to happen? And frankly, family oversight, I think, has to, has to factor into this, this very well. My family, my son, my wife, and I each have one of the South Beach. We live in Virginia Beach, so we each have a South Beach book that we've been using. Yeah, I, I knew you'd like that. Uh, uh, and, and it does work, but, and that's what it's going to take. Well, South and Beach so means South Virginia Beach, where South we're from. South Virginia Beach, that's right. That's what I thought it meant when I bought it. So. And, and, and let me tell you something that really baffles me around here. There are a lot of young people that work on a lot of staffs around here, and I think the thing that upsets me more than anything else, I see some overweight young staffers in their 20s carrying globs of food from the, from the restaurants around here, and they get on an elevator to go down one floor so they can go to their offices and eat it. That's nonsense. We had to lock the elevators up and make these folks walk up and down the steps, walk and do what they're supposed to do. I know there are some members who have cars taken from their offices of capital to vote. Let them walk. It's all about personal responsibility, and I, you know, it's good that we're having this hearing, but when government gets involved, it's going to get screwed up. And frankly, I think government ought to keep their hands out of this and make it the responsibility of the people who are eating the food and if their kids, their children. This chart that was just handed to us, this is outrageous when you think about kids at this age eating you know, bacon, hot dogs, and sausage, it's no wonder we have this problem. So frankly, it's about personal responsibility, and I'm very anxious to hear what the witnesses say today, and maybe uh, what they say here today can help the American people get their act together with their diet, not government. Thank you. I'll yield back. Well, thank you. Uh, we got a great panel here. We, we have uh, Dr. Lester Crawford, the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, Mr. Lynn Swan, uh, who's already been introduced by Mr. Murphy, the Chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Uh, Dr. Eric Henches, the Executive Director of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. They're going to provide the committee with an overview of the federal government's initiatives to combat obesity and promote healthy living. Additionally, these witnesses will offer an update on the process to revise and modernize the federal dietary guidelines and food guide pyramid. It's a policy of the committee we swear you in before you testify. If you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. So I'll make swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. We have a light in front of you. We try to keep as you see, it hasn't, uh, members have gone on, so we want you to say what you have to say. We are just very delighted to have you here today. Uh, Dr. Crawford, I'll start with you and we'll move uh, straight down. Thank you very much. By the way, the light in front of you, when it turns orange, uh, it means uh, four, you, four minutes are up, you have a minute, and the red is five minutes, and you move to summary after that, but uh, we won't hold you strictly accountable. Thank you. You need to push your button. <laughs> there. 
thank you very much for having us here. Um, I'm delighted to be with Dr. Hinches and also Mr. Swan, my colleague. As you know, obesity and weight management has for some time been one of the top public health stories in the media. This hearing is extremely timely in providing a forum to raise awareness not only of the problem, but also of the many initiatives of the federal government to address this epidemic. Today, I will cover the Department of Health and Human Services initiatives and programs designed to assist Americans with maintaining a healthy weight. Obesity has risen at an epidemic rate during the past 20 years. Nearly two-thirds of adults in the United States are overweight, and 31 percent are obese, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The prevalence of overweight and obesity varies by gender, age, socioeconomic status, race, and ethnicity. Overweight and obesity are associated with increased morbidity and mortality, approximately 400,000 adult deaths in the U.S. each year are attributable to unhealthy dietary habits coupled with physical inactivity. The government's role in combating the obesity epidemic, I think, is as follows. Eating a healthy diet and increasing physical activity reduces weight, which is shown to reduce the risk for many chronic diseases. Often small changes, such as physical activity for 30 minutes a day or consuming 100 fewer calories a day, can result in large health benefits. However, individuals must have the right information to make healthy lifestyle choices. In June 2002, President Bush launched the Healthier U.S. initiatives designed to help Americans, especially children, live longer, better, and healthier lives. HHS Secretary Tommy Thompson built on President Bush's Healthier U.S. initiative to create the Steps to a Healthier U.S. program, which provides the overall framework for HHS initiatives addressing obesity and overweight. These initiatives target a variety of populations and include programs in education, communication, and outreach, intervention, diet and nutrition, physical activity, and fitness, disease surveillance research, clinical preventive services and therapeutics, and policy and web-based tools. Two major initiatives that I would like to highlight today are the FDA's Obesity Working Group and NIH's development of an obesity research strategic plan. In August 2003, we at FDA established an obesity working group to determine how the agency could address this problem. In March 2004, the FDA released its comprehensive report to combat obesity with a focus on the message, calories count. The agency's proposals are based on the scientific fact that weight control is mainly a function of the balance between calories consumed and calories expended. For example, the report recommends FDA re-examine the food label to determine how the label can better assist consumers in weight making weight management decisions. The following items are highlighted. We will consider changes to the nutrition facts panel that will further emphasize the focus on calories. We will encourage food manufacturers to revise certain labels as single servings, a voluntary action they can already take to help consumers make more informed choices about their diet. As an example, earlier this week, Kraft Foods reported on a range of initiatives um, with regard to packaging and labeling, helping consumers make informed choices uh, by uh, adding the amount of uh, calories for total packages. And we, we encourage other companies to move in the same direction. To encourage the use, uh, thirdly, of comparative labeling statements to make it easier for consumers to compare different types of foods and make healthier substitutions, and then finally to evaluate the nutrient content claims for the carbohydrate content of foods. FDA has filed three petitions from manufacturers in March of this year and plans to enter into rulemaking to define terms such as low and reduced so that consumers are armed with better and more accurate information. FDA will conduct consumer studies this summer, and we will publish a document by the end of the year. Other major recommendations from this working group include initiating a calories count education program, encouraging restaurants to provide nutrition information to consumers. I'd like to express appreciation to the work of the National Restaurant Association and those restaurants that have acted to provide this information at this point. Strengthening enforcement activities to ensure the accuracy of the information in the nutrition facts panel is another item. Uh, revising FDA's 1996 draft guidance for the clinical evaluation of weight control drugs. 
and increasing collaboration on obesity research. With regard to research, the second major initiative I would like to mention is the NIH Obesity Research Task Force. As the problems of overweight and obesity have grown, the need for new action and research has become more evident. In response, NIH assembled a task force to identify areas for new research across its institutes, and in March of this year, uh, the agency released the draft of its strategic plan. Uh, that plan does the following things. Uh, research will be stimulated towards preventing and treating obesity through lifestyle modification, uh, preventing and treating obesity through pharmacologic, surgical, and other medical approaches, breaking the link between obesity and its associated health conditions, and cross-cutting topics such as in, uh, uh, decreasing health disparities, encouraging technology, fostering of interdisciplinary research teams, investigative training, translational research, and education outreach. Uh, what the last area I'd like to mention is that um, HHS's efforts to work with the international community are continuing. Uh, the World Health Organization Global Strategy on Diet, Physical Activity, and Health holds much promise in the fight against the global epidemic of overweight, and we support that. Mr. Chairman, these are my remarks, and I appreciate uh, the time very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Swan, thank you for being with us. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Sorry. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for having me here. I would uh, be remiss if I didn't first pay my respects to Ms. Blackburn from Tennessee. Uh, as I was born in Alcoa, Tennessee, the first organized team, sports team I played on was a Little League baseball team in Alcoa. Uh, and also the Mr. Waxman, having grown up in California. Uh, the first football team I ever played on was a team called the Peninsula Jets. And then next year, the San Bruno Rams, as I was growing up there, and of course, graduating from and playing football for the University of Southern California. Uh, before, as Mr. Murphy uh, uh, said, I went to Pennsylvania and there played for, uh, for the Steelers for nine years and having some success. Uh, obviously, have you lived anywhere <laughs> where a member of this committee did not? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I should apologize to all members that? of the community that I defeated their teams, <laughs> as it was not intentional. <laughs> It was, it, it was a paid job, and as a professional, I had to do my duty. I, I would like to say that throughout my life, there have always been opportunities for physical activity, to be a member of a team, to participate, to be out, uh, to walk eight blocks to a park and play until the lights went out, to walk to school, to ride my bike to school. As we canvass our nation today, we see there are fewer and fewer opportunities for children to participate. Yes, the better athletes have a chance to be on the varsity football team and basketball team and baseball team. But my oldest brother, who's a dentist, who is 5'6 and about 135 pounds, uh, kids do not have the opportunity to do as he did when he was in high school, which is play on the B or the C basketball team for those who weren't the biggest and the tallest and the most talented, but still provide an opportunity for them to participate and play and to learn from sports and gain the benefits. We have seen and we've heard all the information about obesity rising in our nation. We also have probably looked at the numbers, where they're going to head to in the next 10 years. And the numbers are just ugly. They are preventable. The key word when we look at obesity and obesity-related illnesses and diseases is preventable. And they're preventable through activity, through more physical activity. And we, we have to right now make physical activity a priority. It is not an elective in our lives. If we are going to establish the well-being of a nation, we have to establish physical activity as a priority as well as our intellectual and spiritual well-being, we have to make sure there is a higher level of physical activity so that we can grow, focus, concentrate, and have the endurance to do the jobs that we need to do. Obesity has come not because people are lazy, but because for many reasons it's our own innovation and advances in technology and growth. The internet, robotics, we don't need that large labor force. Parents are concerned about their children's safety, so they walk them to school or they drive them to school, more likely, or the kids don't ride their bicycle. There are ways around this. There are community organizations that have gotten grants that will kit their kids together and create safe walking paths for them to get to school or riding paths for them to ride their bicycles to school. That labor force that we no longer need is going to have to step up in terms of their own individual choices and in how they lead a very physical, active life. Uh, the food, the balance is very important. It's all a balance. It's not just about physical activity, it's about the caloric intake. I did a study or I did a, uh, an interview with a nutritionist at Virginia Tech. And she's a nutritionist for the football team at Virginia Tech. So I asked her, how many calories a day do the offensive and defensive linemen eat during a football year to be physically capable of getting the job done? 
the bigger guys on the team are eating 6,000 calories a day. That's a huge amount of food. But look at the activity level of these young men. One hour a day of weightlifting, a three hour football practice, walking back and forth across campus to get to classes. It is unbelievable. There is a balance there. If you are only exercising up to a point or getting the kind of activity where you're burning up 2,000 calories a day, anything over that means you're going to increase your weight. It's an individual responsibility to understand this. And if Secretary Page doesn't mind if I stick my toe a little bit in his water, if we want our children to understand the proper way to eat, the proper way to exercise, then we have to have better education on the physical fitness side. And that does mean physical education. Uh, if we're not going to have it in the schools, then it's absolutely the priority of our parents, of adults, to set the better example. Yes, our children learn in school, but our children learn by example first. And if the adults aren't taking their kids out for physical activity, then who is? If we don't set a better example, then we're all going to lose in the end. I carry with me a medallion that was given to me by the Surgeon General of the Air Force. And on the back of it, it says, execution is the, ch is the chariot of genius. It was wit written by William Blake. We understand what we have to do. Now it's time to execute a plan. And the plan is simply just to get active. You don't need the best or the most perfect plan. You just need to get going. And I would ask that all of you, whenever you go home to your states, from your districts, whenever you're making a speech as a bipartisan issue, if you would recommend to your constituency, to your followers, to get out and start exercising, every speech you make will go a long way towards getting America a little healthier, a little stronger, and much more active. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Hinches. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am pleased to be here this morning to speak about the efforts of the Department of Agriculture to combat overweight and obesity. Helping Americans live longer, better, healthier lives is a top priority of the President's Healthier U.S. Initiative. In support of the President's initiative, we at USDA are in the midst of updating the Dietary Guidelines for Americans and the Food Guide Pyramid, our current food guidance system. The National Nutrition Monitoring and Related Research Act of 1990 requires the Secretaries of Agriculture and Health and Human Services to jointly publish the Dietary Guidelines for Americans at least every five years. The guidelines form federal nutrition policy they set standards for nutrition assistance programs. They guide nutrition education programs and provide dietary advice for consumers. Through the dietary guidelines, the federal government speaks with one voice on nutrition issues. The Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, comprised of 13 nationally recognized ex experts, were appointed last year to review the latest scientific and medical research. We expect to receive the committee's report later this summer. From this report, USDA and Department of Health and Human Services will publish the sixth edition of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. The newly revised guidelines will be released in early 2005. On a separate but parallel track, we are in the middle of updating the Food Guide Pyramid. The Food Guide Pyramid was created as a teaching tool to assist the public in interpreting the dietary guidelines in eating a healthful diet. We placed a notice in the Federal Register last year asking the public for comment on the technical underpinnings of the Food Guide Pyramid. Use of the Federal Register system opened the process up to the public for the first time. USDA received widespread support for its scientific base of these revisions. The comments supported using calorie levels for sedentary individuals as the basis for assessing nutrition adequacy. Using RDAs and other standards from the National Academy of Sciences dietary reference intake reports as the nutritional goals. Using common household measures such as cups and ounces rather than servings. And emphasizing increased intake in unsaturated fats and oils, whole grains, legumes, and dark green vegetables. A second Federal Register notice will be published this summer to obtain public comment on the graphic image and the education me messages for the new food guidance system. The last and most critical stage of the revision process is implementation. That is, the plan to inform and educate Americans. Research tells us that people recognize the pyramid image, 
but don't follow it. That is why we are so committed to full implementation and exploring new and effective ways to reach the public. USDA's Food and Nutrition Service also plays a critical role in promoting healthy diets and lifestyles for the Federal Nutrition Assistance Program participants. These programs touch the lives of one in five people in the United States each year. They represent a prime opportunity to help low-income people change their eating and physical activity practices to achieve a healthy weight. Mr. Chairman, I would ask the, the committee to refer to my prepared remarks for a list of examples of how the Food and Nutrition Consumer Service mission area is supporting the President's Healthier U.S. initiatives by promoting healthy eating and physical activity throughout our nutrition assistance programs. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, we appreciate the committee's interest in nutrition and its critical role in overall healthy lifestyle. Government has an essential role in helping Americans adopt a healthy lifestyle. That includes eating a nutritious diet, being physically act active, and achieving and maintaining a healthy weight. We know the government alone cannot reverse the growing trend in obesity. Meeting this challenge requires partnerships. These partners include policymakers at federal, state, and local level, industry, health and advocacy organizations, schools, the media, and of course the American public. USDA is fully committed to doing all it can to address this issue. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to share our efforts with you. Well, thank you all very much. Um, you got a I, I could pro ask you two hours of questions. I'm, I've got five minutes and I just want to do a few. First of all, we're updating the food guide pyramid. Is there any evidence that uh, what we've been told the last 40 years uh, may uh, not have been uh, I I exactly the right pyramid for a generation of kids that have turned out to be obese? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the science behind the food guide pyramid is based upon authoritative consensus science, such as the National Academy of Science reports upon the recommended dietary allowances. Do, do, they, do the consensus change over time, though? They, they, it is evolutionary. If we look at the last 60 years, there is new data. And one of the reasons for our current revision is because the National Academy of Science has just gone through a major revision of the dietary reference intakes. So we need to come up to, to stay in touch with where the science is bringing us. I mean, the, um, I, I, this has got to be lobbied heavily behind the scenes. I mean, you talk about interest groups up here in Capitol. You talk about the sugar lobby and the milk producers, uh, Mr. Waxman, th these are well-funded groups. Uh, you know, how you put that food pyramid together uh, can be devastating to their bottom line. Uh, are, you, 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 are you listening to those groups? Are they getting any uh, influence in this, or are you just going strictly scientific consensus? It is scientific, but we take, uh, Under Secretary Boss has definitely set an open door policy okay. for anybody coming in, whether it's uh, American Dietetics Association or a commodity group or Institute of Food Technologists, yeah. all of them coming in. But indeed, if you look at the basis for the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee and that federal policy, everything that comes out in revision of a food guide pyramid will be in total harmony with the nutrition policy. Then let me ask you, you've stayed in shape after your playing days. You look in pretty good shape. Uh, the exercise obviously a critical component, but you can't exercise your way out of obesity if you continue to gorge. Is that, uh, I mean, what's your analysis of that? And how do you, how do you stay in shape and what do you counsel others to do? Well, what, what I do is I monitor how I eat when I eat and I also try and get exercise on a regular basis. I mean, that, that's really an important factor. Um, you have meetings scheduled here. We all schedule the things that are important to us, and we say we don't have time for exercise. That's because we don't schedule it. If you're not exercising, you're not considering it important enough to do it. It's not an elective. For me, it's not an elective, not because I want to be a professional athlete. That's not what it's about. I exercise more now than I ever did before. It's because I want to have a good quality of life. If I reach the age of 80 or 90 years of age, I want those years to be good years. I don't want them to be feeble. I don't want them to be frail. I don't want to fall down and have it be the cause of my death because I'm physically not capable. Uh, so that's what I do. Um, we have a website, thepresidentschallenge.org. Uh, it is set up and designed to give people tools to be physically active, to motivate them, to incent them to have some kind of workout program. And it's a non-competitive program. 
because we have to be mindful of the kids who are not athletic and who don't have the abilities to run and jump and do all those things. <laughs> there are over 100 different forms of physical activity on this list where you can get points towards presidential awards. And so we encourage people to go there. And it's at that site in fitness.gov. You can get a tremendous amount of information. Then you can act on it. But it's got to be in harmony. There's got to be a level of activity and a level of nutrition that goes along with it. Keep in mind, I have friends, and we all have friends who are probably eat extremely well or might be vegans or vegetarians. If you eat 10 times the amount of food you should eat and it's all good for you, then you've consumed a bad quantity of food and it's going to have adverse effects. So you've got to be mindful of the quantity and the quality and making good individual decisions. I, th I think there's universal agreement in the testimony of the three of you that childhood is, the, is the really the best chance to slow the obesity uh, epidemic uh, through food, uh, but also through exercise. Lynn, what are you seeing in the school systems? Are they promoting physical fitness, uh, uh, or do you see it mixed results around the country? Uh, any thoughts on that? Well, we, we see very mixed results around the country. Uh, uh, and before taking this job, I had an opportunity to talk to Governor Schwarzenegger of California uh, about his role. And he spent uh, part of his term when he was chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports trying to reach out to every governor in America to put physical education in the schools. When he started, there was one state, Illinois, that mandated physical education as a part of their educational program. Today, there is only one state in the nation that mandates physical education as a part of the basic curriculum. It is the state of Illinois. It is not California, it's not Pennsylvania, it's not Florida, it's not Texas, it's just Illinois. And so when you go around schools, you see a variety of programs. Some of them are very, very good. Some of them are not even being taught by physical education teachers because there's not a physical education teacher on staff. But there are programs that you can implement. So you have a variety of programs around the nation, but nothing consistent for a nation. Gotcha. Thank you very much. Mr. Waxman. I, I want to thank the three witnesses here today to help us uh, understand what approaches we can take to be effective in dealing with uh, obesity, and I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Dr. Hentges, let me start with you. Uh, nutritional education through that food stamp program is an important way to reach a lot of people. And uh, there have been new guidelines by USDA saying that funds, quote, may not be used to convey negative, written, visual, or verbal expression about any specific foods, beverages, or commodities, end quote. Uh, and then it also provides under these gu this guidance that the um, USDA staff could, has the right to review educational campaigns to make sure there's no belittlement or derogation of such items. Can you explain uh, whether there is any scientific evidence justifying what might be called this, uh, what justifying this provision? <clears throat> I am I'm not real familiar with the issue, but I know the, specifically that one. Mm -hmm. I know that in the revisions and the current activities on the food stamp nutrition education program, they are trying to focus more sharply on these current issues. And I know that within the, the review of education materials that are used throughout the government for communication, there is a cross-agency committee that looks for this speaking with one voice and making sure that we are unified in sticking with the nutrition policy. Well, let me ask you issues. this. Uh, would you uh, be willing to share with, the, with this uh, committee a full explanation of how this provision was developed, including all correspondence with the food industry, all examples of state educational programs that were rejected by USDA staff? I would be very, I'd be very glad to, to uh, provide written comments back to this on the test on yeah. what has occurred in this issue. Well, we want written comments, also your uh, documents and letters for, uh, as it was developed. And I think that would be helpful for us to understand it further. There's another issue as well uh, uh, that I want to ask you about. Uh, the, um, there's a framework for nutrition education that was published uh, May 2004 requiring educational efforts be narrowly targeted at food stamp recipients, and it appears to prohibit states from using the funds as part of a broad social marketing campaign designed to change the eating patterns of the entire community. I'd like to find out what evidence justifies this approach, uh, and uh, uh, perhaps you can also submit to us all the information how that was developed. Okay. 
I, I am vaguely familiar again with this, and I know that from a regulatory standpoint that there are restrictions on uh, using these funds with the participants, but where there is an overlap of public service or community announcement aimed at the, at the uh, food assistant participants, there is a broader range of, of reach to the community. And I w will again provide okay, well, you the specifics well, on that. Well, what I'm sir. concerned about is what evidence would justify this kind of restriction because it would seem that if it, an obesity is a public health program, we wouldn't want to say you can only talk about uh, the obesity issues to the food stamp recipients if the state wanted to go broader than that and talk about all kids, not just the kids on food stamps. You would yes. agree with that? Yes, okay. and I, I would uh, say that our programs at the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion are aimed at the general public, and we work with the Food Nutrition Service then for their specific programs and what they're allowed to do with the, with the uh, recipients of food assistance. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the restrictions about belittling food, I, I find it troubling because, for example, you might say to eat an apple a day is a good healthy thing to do, but you'd be prohibited from saying don't eat more junk food. Isn't that correct? Because that might be belittling junk food? I, and I will have to get back to you on exactly what those regulations are. Okay. Um, Dr. Crawford, I uh, mentioned in my opening comments about the, the, the false and misleading information that I think may be uh, uh, made available to the consumers inappropriately under the NLEA. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, know how the FDA could say they're not going to enforce the law on uh, information that doesn't have a scientific uh, consensus behind it and how FDA would allow scientists uh, even when th there's an extremely low level of comfort about the claim uh, to be permitted to go ahead and make these uh, make these claims. So are you familiar with um, uh, are you familiar with this uh, with this uh, provision by the FDA and uh, can the FDA uh, uh, justify taking this action even though it's inconsistent with the law? Yes, I, I am familiar. The, uh, the concept is this. Uh, we uh, had some adverse court rulings with some positions we'd taken on uh, health claims. So we um, developed the idea of growing out of that and uh, with some internal uh, consideration of, of uh, allowing qualified health claims. And uh, basically what this means is that although scientific consensus might not be 100%, uh, it is uh, enough to where we're able to say um, if, if the company or if the organization applying for the health claim uh, would be willing to qualify it uh, honestly and directly in terms of how strong the evidence is, we would consider what's called a qualified health claim. On the walnut issue that you mentioned, yeah. uh, that grows out of the fact that uh, walnuts were determined to have omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, also it was determined that the omega-3 fatty acids in walnuts were bioavailable. So it followed that, um, that, we, that they could get a qualified health claim if they intended to. And there was also some talk uh, earlier I'm not sure it was you, but someone about uh, what does this do for competition. And actually, when a qualified health claim is granted, uh, any company that produces, sells, markets, walnuts yeah, in this case, may use it. It's not Well, it allows, it allows more than one manufacturer yes. to make claims that are qualified, but in, in reality could be scientifically inaccurate, maybe even misleading. Uh, and uh, when the law says pro prohibit, pro Descriptively, that it, you ought to have a scientific consensus before you can go out and make these kinds of claims. This seems to me uh, the FDA rewriting the law, and I think it. Uh, I think one of the dangers is it turns out to be a tower of Babel of misleading information, and the public is going to doubt the credibility of any of these labels, especially if it's an FDA label, uh, because they'll know that it's uh, it's not based on good science, and qualified answers may not be based on good science, and it may not. Re represent what Congress spoke to, which is that there really is a scientific consensus before these kinds of claims can be made. It's obviously in the advantage of the manufacturer to make claims that are misleading. And, uh, and we don't want that to happen. We didn't want that to happen when we passed the law. I'm afraid the FDA uh, 
uh, policy uh, undermines that uh, provision. So I, I want to register that. Uh, if I could follow up. Sure. Um, sure. We, we don't think it undermines the policy. We, what we find is that there rarely is 100 percent scientific consensus. So the question is whether you allow any uh, exposition of what the health advantages of a food might be and, and in, in, a, in a way that is qualified so that it's honest and is not misleading. And that's what we're attempting to do. Thank you very much. And Mr. Shays. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for conducting this hearing. And I would like to put on the record that Mr. Osi would tempt us to take some of the snacks that he has stacked up at his desk. And I had a heat of junk crunch meal? and one Oreo cookie, but turned down a lot of other things. I would like to ask each of you whether you think there is logic to companies being sued uh, because they offer a menu that uh, people don't eat in moderation, blaming the companies uh, instead of their own children or their own oversight of their own children and so on. I'd like you to speak to that issue. Um, I do not think there's logic in that. I think what we have to do is inculcate individual responsibility. Uh, I think the government has a role, and I believe all three agencies represented here have uh, a big part of that role, to try to get things back on, on course. And I also think supporting um, mandatory physical education programs, as Mr. Swan has mentioned, is also important. But I do not see the logic of, of that. I mean, if someone wants to sue a fast food company or something like that, because of their abrogation of individual responsibility, I, I don't think that follows. Um, I, I, I would simply state that uh, I, ag I agree. Uh, you know, we have to make sure that people are educated to make good individual choices and decisions. Uh, I think that all of us who are sitting in this room have the, the, the foods that we would put in the junk food category uh, that we like to eat, we like to, we enjoy. Uh, but. Uh, it is the decision not to eat the whole bag if you're going to have a few potato chips, uh, not to eat a dozen donuts if you want to have one, uh, and have a proper amount of physical activity to balance it out, and it's individual responsibility. Uh, certainly, we want to make sure that the individual knows what he or she is consuming, and so labeling becomes very important, but I just do not see the logic in suing a company for w what we individually decide to eat. I would say that the challenge before us is really more effective implementation, whether it's through our food label, through our dietary guidance, or through our guide system, whether it be a pyramid or whatever. And that to be able to do that, we need to have partnerships, not only partnerships amongst the academic and health organizations, but we need the industry to partner with us to be able to get this information out and so that we avoid some of these other alternatives. I thank all, all three witnesses. I, I also want to thank Mr. Waxman, who's not here, because uh, in years past he was very involved in labeling issues, and I think they're absolutely essential. We provide all the information we can possibly have. I think the FDA can continue to do a better job. I think you can continue, sir, doctor, to, to uh, find different ways to help educate people. And, um, but the bottom line for me is, I am absolutely amazed that parents would have their kids sue someone. Uh, they just need to look at themselves and their own responsibilities. And I hope our country doesn't go down the route of blaming someone else for the responsibility of the individual. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I just thank you for this hearing. I think it's very important, and I appreciate all of the witnesses in our second panel as well. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, let me thank you for holding this hearing. I think this is a very important important hearing. Um, before I start, I would like to um, ask you, Mr. Chairman, if I could put the high calorie, low nutrient uh, foods in a children's diet early in the record, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to place it in the record. Well, without objection, it will be put in the record at this point. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Crawford, um, does your department collaborate with the Department of Education? Uh, Y yes, sir, we do. Well, yeah, go ahead. With respect to obesity, um, we have worked out an agreement uh, with uh, Secretary Page so that uh, we will partner with them in terms of the education message uh, because obviously he has more access to 
the target audience is in the education message, particularly in the schools. And uh, so, yes, we had, uh, when we had the obesity working group, uh, we, he designated uh, a contact person and I designated one. And the two of them have been working together. And uh, so we do partner with them, yes. Do you have an opportunity to ever look at the school lunch program? Uh, I, um, that is not in our, that's in the Department of Agriculture. No, yeah, but I said, do you have, have you had the opportunity to ever look at the, not that you I've have. Eat, I've eaten it. some of them, yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but not in a long time. You know, because the reason I ask that, because you know, when you look at some of the uh, things that they're serving young people, you know, today in some of the schools, you know, I, I think it's a shame. And um, nobody's saying anything. That's the reason why I raise this issue. I know it's not your, directly in your jurisdiction, but I think that when it comes to guidelines and getting information out, it seemed to me that, uh, that you would sort of convey, you know, to the department and, of course, uh, uh, and we will also raise this issue with the Department of Agriculture as well. But I think that is the basis. If you start then in the kindergarten and first grade serving these kind of things to kids and they think it's okay because after all the school is doing it. Yes. Well, I, I take your point and I think, I think you're exactly right. What we need to do is start early, like you said, but we also need to give them, uh, I think, a few more tools to work with for example, if you um, look on the nutrition label now, and uh, we hope the nutrition label will be, under our agreement with the Department of Education, the mechanism by which young children are trained to take this individual responsibility at an early age. Uh, but on the label now, it, does, it, it says what an, op, an item's calorie content is, but it doesn't relate that to the amount of calories you're allowed to consume in one day on average and maintain your weight. So we're moving towards having on the label, uh, if, you, if you drink a milkshake that is uh, 1,000 calories, for example, it now will say in bigger letters that it is 1,000 calories um, in the future. But it also will say you have just now eaten 50% of what you can eat today and maintain your weight and not increase weight. And we think these, you could say it's a simple message, but the science of it is, is elegant, really. And I think we can use that as a means to educate students. I remember in my own case, um, when I was consuming those school lunch programs, we had mandatory in the state that I grew up, what was called a health book in the third grade. And in the third grade, we it, you know, we were taught the basic food groups. We were taught about calorie-dense foods. We were taught about junk foods. And uh, I think it, it did instill individual responsibility. But we didn't have many tools in those days. We didn't have a nutrition label. It's up to us at FDA and the rest of the government to make it work, and also to make it work for all of the people in America, including the children. Right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you want to add something on that? Yes, please, yes. Indeed, by statute, it is required that... Turn your microphone. By statute, it is required that the school lunch programs do comply with the dietary guidelines and other criteria set by the secretary. And those include that the school lunch program not be more than 30% of calories from fat, not more than 10% of calories from saturated fat, that they meet the RDAs, a third of the RDAs for protein, calcium, iron, vitamin A, and vitamin C. I think part of the issue here is that as a local decision, schools can decide to include competitive foods. But when a child gets a school lunch program meal, it does comply with the dietary guidelines and established. But there is this issue of competing foods, which is a local level decision. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you very much. That's the issue. Let me just, just uh, Mr. Chairman, just give me a second. I want to ask uh, 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 Mr. Swan one question. You know, first of all, um, you know, thank you for the work that you're doing. But you know, uh, uh, how do we deal with the situation where there's uh, budget budget cuts, and as soon as you cut the budget, the first thing goes out is the ex extracurricular activities, such especially intramural sports. I mean, that's the first thing they eliminate. You know, uh, how do we get around that? Because uh, that's the real problem. Uh, it, it is a real problem. Uh, Mr. Schrock earlier uh, had talked about individual uh, responsibility. 
and, and not having too much government. Uh, but the reality is on our website, the President's Challenge dot org. Uh, the President's uh, Physical Fitness Program is one that can be implemented in schools and does not require necessarily a physical education teacher. So there are programs that teachers and school districts can implement. They may not be an organized sports team that would be competitive in some nature, but they can organize those intramural sports teams on their own. They can implement a physical education program within their classroom, whatever their curriculum might be. It could be as simple as saying that well, instead of you sitting in this classroom for an hour, that we provide 10 minutes that you get up and stretch, you walk around, you move your legs, so that you're not sedentary for the entire school day at any particular age. So I agree with you that when money is tight, the, the sports programs, the physical education programs, or even the arts and music programs are the first to go because they're not mandated by a particular state's uh, educational program but there are other ways to get that exercise in, yeah. and we have to seek those other ways, because again, it sh should not be an elective, it should be a priority in our lives. Thank you. We have a, um, other members want to ask questions, but we have a vote on, and in addition to that, one of our witnesses on the next panel has to catch a helicopter down. I want to get his testimony in before he has to go. So what I'd like to do is call Dr. Stuart Traeger up from the Atkins Institute and swear you in now, and Dr. Traeger, if you could give your testimony now. Mr. Chairman, yes. while the doctor's coming up, could I, could we just go ahead and reverse There's something in California that's just for 31 and a half years, this issue in California has existed. And we have in front of us a witness today who can finally put to rest the truth about what happened on December 23rd, 1972, when the Oakland Raiders were robbed <laughs> in Pittsburgh. Well, you have him under oath. This is your shot. I understand I'll, I'll get you under to do that real quick. That's exactly my point. And before I get an answer to that, I also want to examine this. This witness went to USC, and there were a number of occasions in the early 70s when his college team came to University of California and attempted, attempted, I say, to defeat the Cal Bears. And I just want to get on the record some answers to some questions, if I could, Mr. Chairman. All right, quickly. Okay. Well, Swanee? As, as quickly as possible, uh, we, we may... Well, let me ask a question first. <laughs> the proceeding was brought to you as a community service of this cable company. Down, and I myself, being so much younger, was just a junior at USC playing on the national championship team, and so I can't give you any. I want to let the witness testimony, Mr. Chairman. Let the record show that the witness had no knowledge whatsoever of what occurred in Pittsburgh <laughs> Stadium that day. Thank you, Dr. Traeger. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, being with us. And this is important testimony. He is keynoting that obesity where I think Mr. Swan, you and, and Dr. Crawford are going a little, or, or Mr. Hentges are going later, and, but he's going to keynote, so he has to catch a helicopter ride down there. And would have moved, moved him up to the panel had I known we'd be delayed this long with the markup. But this is important testimony as well because uh, Atkins uh, has uh, kind of revolutionized the way a lot of us look at food and food products. Dr. Traeger, thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for accommodating my schedule. Members of the committee, I both thank you all for asking me to appear today and commend you for addressing the government's role in combating the obesity epidemic and promoting healthy ways for individuals to fight this critical public health issue. If we go to the next slide, please. By way of an introduction, my name is Stuart Traeger. I'm medical director of Atkins Nutritionals. I, too, am an avid Atkins adherent following this approach for the last four years of my life. I practice orthopedic surgery, and I'm an eight-time Ironman finisher. See you next to our panel today. It's tough for, to get much out of that Ironman finisher. However, at the time, it seems pretty difficult. Taken together, this rather unique combination of experiences has given me great insight into the challenges presented to those fighting to maintain healthy weight, to those living with the medical complications of obesity, and to those frustrated by their own inability to achieve weight loss through exercise. Though the banner at the finish of the Ironman says anything is possible, I'm afraid for many, running 35 miles to burn the 3,500 calories necessary 
to shed one pound of body weight is just too great an obstacle to overcome. To create a strategy for success, it's critical that we appreciate the factors that have resulted in the current epidemic of obesity. Surely schedules are more hectic than ever, portion sizes are expanding as rapidly as our waistlines, and highly processed convenient foods are omnipresent. These circumstances have created real challenges to the nation. To begin, we must be willing to move beyond the one-size-fits-all approach that has dominated the nutritional dogma for the last three decades. Next slide, please. This one. I, I've, thank you. As we address the challenges of the nation associated with this current epidemic, it's worth recalling the words of Dr. Walter Willett from the Harvard School of Public Health, who stated, Mainstream nutritional science has demonized dietary fat, yet 50 years and hundreds of millions of dollars of research have failed to prove that eating a low-fat diet will help you live longer. Facing hard truths is never easy. However, the current obesity crisis is currently estimated at taking 400,000 lives each year. The dietary guidelines are clearly not working, and prospects for inclusion of alternatives in the rewrite are not entirely promising. There is a clear need to challenge the status quo and to continue to fight the nutritional establishment and conventional wisdom if we are going to stem this epidemic. When USDA surveys show that while 80% of Americans recognize the food pyramid, very few heed its advice, it's clear that we need alternatives. As we move forward, our strategy must provide real-life tools that work in the current environment. For an increasing number of people, it's becoming clear that controlling carbohydrates is one such option. Next slide, please. Because promising magic is no more beneficial than prescribing strategies that are unobtainable, we must always remember that solutions to this epidemic have to be supported by evidence-based science. Increasing public awareness about the importance of scientific validation of safety and efficacy is important. And with Atkins, it is clear that this has helped many recognize the benefits of this strategy. The consistent stream of supportive clinical research, next slide please, including these two independently funded studies, one from the American Heart Association and the other from the National Institute of Health, have opened many eyes to the safety and efficacy of controlling carbohydrates as an alternative to traditional dietary recommendations. Next slide. The recent publication of two additional studies, one from Duke, the other from the Philadelphia Veterans Hospital, have led further support. Simply put, for many, weight loss occurs more rapidly when following Atkins, more calories can be consumed while on Atkins, compliance is enhanced on Atkins, and risk factors, as well as diabetic control, improve while on Atkins. Next slide. With recent editorials in the Annals of Internal Medicine and the American Journal of Cardiology, it's clear that we are making much progress in changing opinions. It is at times easy to forget that despite the critical importance of science in this debate, and that we must never rely on anecdotal reporting, that this is about helping people. To that end, I thought it worthwhile reminding everyone why we are really here. The individuals losing weight and improving risk factors in these studies on Atkins have names and faces. Next slide, please. Real people in the real world are losing weight and improving their cardiac risk factors by following the Atkins approach, something Dr. Atkins fought for 30 years to make the establishment pay attention to. Next slide. Counting carbohydrates is simply more palatable for many than eating smaller portions of less satisfying foods. Next slide. At Atkins Nutritionals, we feel a tremendous sense of responsibility to assure that this powerful tool is used correctly, that people obtain the best possible results, and that we truly impact the epidemic of obesity. We have helped develop the Atkins Food Guide Pyramid to address the myths and misconceptions put forth by the low-fat advocates, the animal right activists, and the copycats who would have you believe that Atkins is just about red meat and bacon. If you look at the Food Guide Pyramid, and we've distributed one, you see there's lots of fruits, vegetables, and the right carbohydrates. This was Dr. Atkins' effort put forth in January before he died last year. We are actively reaching out to decision makers here in Washington, and we are committed to helping spread our message of carbohydrate awareness through our education and youth initiatives. 
We are committed to ensure that the public knows the correct way to control carbohydrates, the time-tested way that science has repeatedly validated. Next slide. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the committee for taking the time to discuss this very important matter. To make a difference, we believe Congress should invest in more science to provide additional information regarding this alternative to the low-fat, low-calorie dogma of the last three decades, and continue to scrutinize guideline revisions and allow for more seats at this very important table. Thank you. Dr. Traeger, thank you. We are uh, here at the mercy of the congressional schedule, which is they have votes scheduled right now, th a series of three votes. One of them, in fact, is on anabolic steroids and, and uh, stopping their use and proliferation, so it's relevant to what we're doing. Um, so we're going to come back in a half an hour. I'd like to dismiss this panel uh, so that you all can get on with business. I just want to ask one last question. Y you've heard Dr. Traeger talk about more investment in scientific research. I know Dr. Atkins had always said, you know, he, he, he was kind of, it wasn't hand to mouth, but he didn't have the millions to invest in. Is that a good idea? And from an agriculture point of view and FDA, are we, are we putting enough or could you use more resources if Congress provided them? I would definitely support the, the administration's budget request on, on research. And it is an area that we can't let fall behind okay. for sure. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, there are tens of millions of people who are choosing this controlled carbohydrate approach and are following the Atkins strategy. You see it everywhere you go. No the marketplace will overwhelm government if government doesn't react. And, and what, we're, what we're looking for is more research dollars so that this can be studied, so that we can have the long-term studies. Because we know that it works, we now need to, to add the science to it to help these people okay. to make sure the message is clear so they get the information to do it correctly. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree that we do need uh, the kind of targeted research that this new uh, roadmap uh, that the National Institutes of Health has put together uh, because of the funding that Congress has been able to provide them. And we need targeted basic research to know some of these things, like why does obesity do what it does? We still haven't, we still okay. don't really know that. Well, thank you. And I, and I know Mr. Swan would say more research is fine, but don't cut out the PE programs. Is that, I, I hear your testimony. <laughs> This has been great. I wish, as I said, I wish we could go on all day. I could have to go two hours just with my own questions. I know Mr. Osi's got his major question out of the way for this, but we'll come back to the next I panel. More, Mr. Chairman, if you're going to excuse this panel, I've. <laughs> I'm, I'm bailing. Out. Thank you all very much, and we'll uh, recess for half an hour and come back uh, with the next panel. Well, it's not. Any longer. <laughs> um, we definitely Thank you. We've been very kind. This, this, this meeting was very, un it was unexpected. Yeah. There were more members that were this morning. I know you couldn't yeah. call that. Thank, Thank you, you so much for indeed. For See you later. Thank you for Why don't I swear this panel in? Uh, we got everybody here. If you'd rise with me and raise your right hand. Camille, come back to order. Uh, Salome, swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for being here. We'll get members drifting back from a series of votes we just had, and we'll have another series of votes probably in about an hour, maybe a little before that. So I want to move through the testimony quickly so we can get to questions. I, can't tell you how excited we are about the, the panel that we have here today and, and uh, the expertise and the, and the opinions that you bring to this. Uh, so um, what, what I think I will do, uh, we have Dr. Arthur Agatson, who's already been introduced by uh, uh, Leanna Ross Leighton. Uh, we have uh, Dr. G. Harvey Anderson, who's a professor of the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto, Dr. Susan Finn, chair of the American Council for Fitness and Nutrition. And then uh, Bruce uh, Silverglade, who's a, uh, you got to have a lawyer on the panel. He's the uh, director of Legal Affairs Center for Science in the Public Interest. Um, 
Doctor, why don't we start with you and we'll move straight on down the line. And, and thanks so much uh, for being with us. And uh, I'll just say up uh, I had a hot dog and tuna fish for lunch. I don't know if it's good <laughs> or bad, but uh, at least it's uh, low carbs. Uh, no, no, no comment. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Davis. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Representative Ross Leighton for her very kind words. Um, there is a major untold story currently unfolding in America. Cardiologists and internists across the country who are practicing aggressive prevention have largely stopped seeing heart attacks and strokes in their practices. They just don't get called to the emergency room for these events like they used to. The factors that are changing the cardiac prevention paradigm include non-invasive imaging to detect and track early preclinical arteriosclerosis, advanced blood testing to determine the cause of preclinical disease, new medications that target causes of disease like laser beams, and finally a growing consensus on the nutritional factors associated with our epidemic of obesity. I am a cardiologist, not a diet doctor. My journey to authoring a diet book occurred somewhat accidentally. Until 10 years ago, my primary research interest was in non-invasive imaging of the coronary arteries. Around that time, it became more and more apparent that my patients, the country, and frankly me, were rapidly gaining weight on the nationally recommended low-fat, high-carbohydrate guidelines. In fact, there had been a, become a disconnect between the practical day-to-day -day experience of clinicians and the national guidelines. In America, low-fat, high-carb diets just didn't work, and this was actually documented in the medical literature again and again. The low-fat, high-carb recommendations were made primarily on the basis of population studies that demonstrated that societies that consume low-fat diets had lower rates of heart attack and obesity than high-fat societies. There were exceptions, such as Mediterranean populations, where high-fat intake was associated with low heart attack and obesity rates. In the past 5 to 15 years, research has gone a long way to explain what went wrong with our low-fat experiment. In particular, three new perspectives have become widely accepted. First came the understanding of the importance of fiber and glycemic index in our diet. The glycemic index is a measure actually pioneered by um, my colleague here, Dr. Dr. Anderson, and his group at the University of Toronto. Um, it's a measure of how fast the food causes swings in blood sugar. Rapid swings in blood sugar cause food cravings soon after a meal. High fiber foods tend to be low on the glycemic index. Second came the concept of prediabetes in 1989. We learned that a low fiber, high glycemic diet often resulted in obesity, prediabetes, and then diabetes by amplifying those swings in blood sugar. Third, new research demonstrated that not all fats are equal. Mediterranean oils, particularly olive and omega-3 oils, have favorable effects on both cardiovascular and general health. With this important new information, the causes of our epidemic of obesity became apparent. Number one, the type of carbohydrate consumed in the low-fat countries was high in fiber and low in glycemic index, while that adopted in the United States was low in fiber and high in glycemic index. The consumption of unprecedented amounts of high glycemic, pro glycemic processed carbohydrates produced swings in our blood sugars that resulted in frequent cravings and increased caloric intake leading to the obesity epidemic. Secretary Tommy Thompson announced recently that over 40 percent of Americans over the age of 40 are pre-diabetic. Number three, was because animal protein in our diets is from corn-fed cattle and poultry that do not run free. It has high levels of saturated fat and insignificant levels of healthy omega-3 oils. Number four, in an attempt to lessen our intake of saturated fat, trans fats were introduced and became ubiquitous in our commercial baked goods and fast foods. We now know that trans fats are worse than saturated fats for both our waistlines and our blood vessels. In response to my own frustration with a low-fat diet, in 1995, I decided to try a different approach. I was also influenced by the beginning of the low-carb diet trend pioneered by Dr. Atkins. While I found the low-carb diet approach fascinating, I felt that the scientific evidence pointed in a slightly different direction. In my, 
uh, my patients had already had heart problems and or were at high risk for heart disease. There was too much evidence that saturated fat was associated with coronary disease. On the other hand, evidence was growing that the healthy Mediterranean oils had favorable effects on our lipids and on our cardiovascular health. As far as carbohydrates, it became clear that what was causing our epidemic of obesity was not carbohydrates per se, but the processed, rapidly digested high glycemic carbohydrates. The good non-processed carbohydrates were too rich in vitamins and nutrients to restrict. We developed a simple and flexible diet plan for our patients that followed the principles of good nutrient-dense carbohydrates, healthy fats, and lean proteins. There was no counting calories, grams of fats, or grams of carbohydrates. While calories definitely count, it was our observation that counting calories alone did not work. Carbohydrate, carbohydrate choices were made on the basis of glycemic index. We found that when proper food choices were made, hunger and cravings diminished and fewer calories were consumed. We also strongly encourage exercise throughout for burning calories, for building and maintaining lean body mass, and for cardiovascular health. After years of frustration, I was amazed and gratified by our patients' response to our program. They lost weight, their blood chemistries improved, and they found the diet easy to follow. We, get, we began reporting our findings at national meetings in 1997. Our clinical experience indicated that diet could truly become a lifestyle. Weight loss was usually sustained, and the manifestations of prediabetes and often of type 2 diabetes were reversed. In 1999, local TV asked us to put South Florida on what is now called the South Beach Diet, which we did very successfully for three years. This led us from the clinical and academic realm to the public sector. The success of the South Beach, Beach Diet has given me a unique opportunity to help change the way America eats. We have recently established a not-for-profit research institute to study nutrition and cardiac prevention and are planning a study of school ch children where bad eating habits begin. The following are my recommendations for incorporating the South Beach Diet principles into the federal guidelines. The diet pyramid should be updated as planned. The base should be occupied by the good carbohydrates, vegetables, whole fruits, whole grains. The next level should include lean proteins, low-fat dairy products, uh, and good fats. Above the good fats should be saturated fats, and then above that, processed carbohydrates, and at the apex, trans fats, which we should be um, absolutely restricting. The benefits of proper diet and vigorous exercise must bec become part of school curriculum. Continued efforts, efforts are necessary to educate the public regarding healthy food choices. I believe that the principles of nutrient-dense, good carbohydrates, good fats, lean protein, and plenty of exercise have recently become the consensus of scientific opinion. If applied successfully to the American lifestyle, our epidemic of obesity and diabetes can be reversed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Anderson. And thank you, Chairman Davis. And thank you for this opportunity to address your committee on the obesity epidemic. We all agree that the increase in the prevalence of obesity in the past 25 to 30 years is both startling and alarming. But the question is, what is its origin? And we don't have an answer to that question, or we don't have a simple answer. Therefore, my message to governments is that their role must be to keep a steady hand on the helm and stay the course until we have both evidence for an agreement on a solution or solutions. Obesity arises from both environmental factors and genetic factors, but it's agreed that the rapid increase in the prevalence of obesity is primarily environmental. Americans at all socioeconomic levels are getting fatter, and some have attributed this to the toxic environment of inexpensive, readily available food, reduced activity, increased wealth, longevity, stress in the workplace, advertising, and even mother's diet, just to name a few of the potential factors. The point is, the origins of this obesity epidemic are not defined and are complex. So how can we offer short-term solutions? In my opinion, the role of government at the present time is to stay the established course of providing dietary guidance to the public and to avoid any dramatic changes in the current dietary guidelines and food guides. Some argue for change, but where is the evidence? Change in dietary guidance must be based on what we describe in medicine as evidence-based decision-making. 
This is a systematic approach that categorizes the quality of evidence that's available. It does not give equal weighting to each piece of evidence and does not arrive at simply a consensus solution. In other words, the loudest and most articulate speaker does not sway the evidence in the final decision. Governments should have, as a policy, assurance that the principles of evidence-based decision-making, this principle is applied to all forms of dietary guidance. Current practice is to base dietary guidelines on evidence and consensus, but does not apply evidence-based systems. I would also like to remind you that dietary gu guidance is for the maintenance of health and prevention of disease. Dietary guidelines are guidance statements for government policy and provide the basis for consumer messages. Food-based guidance to the public is provided by both dietary guidelines and food guidance, that's the pyramid. And if followed by the individual, this guidance will lead to food choices providing nutrient adequate diets and reducing the risk of chronic disease. Of course, modification of this general guidance is appropriate for subpopulations of different cultures or genetic makeup, as well as those who have developed markers of the disease process, for example, high blood cholesterol. I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with current dietary guidance. The question is why don't people follow our guidance and select healthier diets, eat less, and exercise more? We do not have the answer, but it seems to me we need to make a greater effort to communicate our existing dietary guidance in more effective ways. Shifting dietary guidance without scientific evidence is irresponsible and will only add to more confusion. And because of the presence of the other speakers, I know that you know that carbohydrate, the base of the pyramid, has been brought into question, so I want to address that specific issue. Many hypotheses have been advanced suggesting carbohydrates are the cause of obesity, and one suggests that sugars and processed carbohydrates bypass food intake regulatory systems, thereby causing obesity. The evidence is to the contrary, and this is my area of expertise. My research shows that all sources of energy and diet contribute to satiety. Carbohydrates, including sugars, are satiating. Carbohydrates are more satiating than fats, and less so than proteins, although I must note that the ranking amongst these depends on quantity and source. So the real question is, what is in the environment that causes people to eat too much food and ignore basic physiological signals? Why don't people eat more fruits and vegetables and whole grain cereals or whole grain products as described in the base of the pyramid? Why don't they make the right choice? So hypotheses on the role of the food supply in the obesity epidemic are abundant and require testing and the application of evidence-based decision making before we are in a position to suggest food-based solutions that are effective. However, I am convinced that food-based solutions will not be effective unless we also tackle other environmental factors contributing to obesity, including the low level of activity associated with our current lifestyles. In the meantime, let us find ways to be more effective in empowering individuals to follow the current dietary guidance. In closing, I would like to draw your attention to a recent publication on dietary guidelines, past experience, and new approaches published in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association in December 2003. It was my privilege to serve as co-organizer of that meeting and as co-editor of the publication. This international conference strongly advocated the application of an evidence-based approach to modification of food-based guidance for the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Finn. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis. Is this on? No. If I could push your button. There. Okay. Now it's on. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Davis. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the federal government's role in addressing the nation's obesity epidemic. I chair the American Council for Fitness and Nutrition, or ACFN, as we commonly refer to it. I'm also the past president of the American Dietetic Association. As you've heard this morning, we all agree that obesity is a growing concern for all Americans. Recognizing the serious nature of this issue, in January of last year, a coalition of food and beverage companies, restaurants, and related trade associations founded the American Council for Fitness and Nutrition to work towards comprehensive and achievable solutions to the nation's obesity epidemic. 
Today, ACFN represents more than 65 diverse organizations, and our work is guided by an advisory board of 27 distinguished experts in nutrition, physical activity, and behavioral change. The epidemic of obesity did not occur overnight, or even within the last decade. Understanding the contributing factors and the fundamental driving forces provides a key to solving this complex and multifaceted challenge. ACFN believes, as do most experts in the field, that the ultimate solution to obesity is about energy balance, matching calories burned with calories consumed. And in order to accomplish this seemingly simple objective, people must moderate their calorie intake to match their energy expenditure by eating less, being more physically active, or really ideally doing both. The federal government has an important role to pay, play in helping to solve the nation's battle with weight. But we recognize the federal government cannot fight this battle alone. It requires the action of all sectors of society. Towards that end, ACFN is working with health professionals, educators, policymakers, and consumers to develop lasting approaches to combat obesity. These approaches, focusing on improving communication to Americans, about the need to balance nutrition with physical activity. While it is clear that the problem of obesity is widespread, its impact on America's youth deserves special attention. We know, for example, that children who participate in physical education programs fare better acad academically, personally, and physically than those who are inactive. However, physical education requirements in our public schools have been declining or dramatically over the last 20 years. And in only about half of our elementary schools do they have PE teachers on staff. ACFN applauds Congress and the federal government for numerous important initiatives that seek to address these objectives. For example, the Improved Nutrition and Physical Activity Act, IMPACT as it is called, passed by the Senate last December would provide much needed funding to develop community-based programs. We urge the House of Representatives to pass companion legislation sponsored by Representative Mary Bono and 77 other members of Congress. ACFN has touted the benefit of PEP grants distributed by the U.S. Department of Education. PEP grants provide local communities with funding to improve existing physical education programs or launch new youth-focused initiatives. We hope Congress will continue to fully fund this critical program. The Department of Health and Human Service programs, including Healthier U.S. and the Small Steps to Better Health campaigns, focus on health prevention by encouraging Americans to improve their lifestyles while eating a balanced diet and increasing their physical activity. Earlier this year, ACFN responded to HHS's request for partners to promote Healthier U.S. initiatives. In the recent report, the Food and Drug Administration Obesity Task Force proposed a calorie count campaign and made several recommendations to improve consumer understanding of appropriate serving sizes. Through the Grocery Manufacturers of America, the food and beverage industry is responding to FDA's work by conducting consumer research to better understand how to communicate caloric content, especially for single servings. And under the auspices of HHS and USDA, revisions to the Dietary Guidelines for Americas and America and the Food Guide Pyramid present an important opportunity to formulate guidelines that can help people of all socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds improve their health. While the existing pyramid has recently become the subject of some debate, one thing is clear. It is one of the most widely recognized nutrition education tools in the marketplace. ACFN members are committed to promoting the new guidelines when they are released next year. And the Five-A-Day Better Health Program partnership between the National Cancer Institute and the Produce for Better Health Foundation showcases the scope and reach a public education program can achieve with private sector involvement. In addition, ACF strongly encourages the government to assess what gaps in research exist regarding obesity's causes and solutions either through projects of its own or by partnering with agencies or private sector organizations like ACFN. In conclusion, the food and beverage industry acknowledges the role it plays in providing consumers with many foods and beverages they enjoy every day and is committed to doing its part to help consumers 
better understand how they must balance what they eat with what they do. Clearly, all sectors of society, including the food industry, must work to together to combat obesity. Ultimately, in individuals have to make a choice about the foods they eat and the level of physical activity they engage in. Government can and should provide information to help consumers make informed choices. And Congress must embrace proposals that are positive, comprehensive, and address obesity as an issue rooted in improper energy balance. After all, this discussion is not simply about weight gain. It is about the health of our nation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Silverblade. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity to testify, and I commend you for uh, holding these hearings on this uh, vitally important issue. Uh, the committee has asked us to address several specific questions. Uh, I will address each of them in turn. Uh, the first and I guess most important question is what is our, our view of government's role in shaping uh, health policy, uh, especially on the subject of controlling weight? Well, we believe the answer to that is, is simple. Uh, federal, state, and local public health agencies have a major role to play in ensuring that the food industry provides consumers with a healthy food environment. This is perhaps a new term, but I'm going to be using it several times in my testimony. We need a healthy food environment at the supermarket, in schools, at the workplace, and in public settings. Presently, consumers face a very hostile food environment. By this I mean fast food outlets across America heavily promote high fat, high sugar, and high salt foods and beverages. Vending machines in schools, hospitals, and airports offer mostly high fat, high sugar, and high salt snack foods and soft drinks. Food companies fill the airwaves, magazines, and internet sites with more than seven billion dollars worth of marketing messages for mostly high fat, high sugar, high salt foods often consumed by children. That seven billion dollar figure contrasts sharply with the meager four to five million dollars spent by the U.S. government on its five uh, fruits and vegetables a day program. Now, government is also partly to blame for the hostile food environment. And, and several members of the committee this morning raised the question whether government should be involved. Well, government's part of the problem, so it must be part of the solution. For example, Congress requires that full fat whole milk be offered it, at schools participating in the national school lunch program. This was a requirement uh, uh, passed at the behest of the dairy industry, which lobbied Congress. Uh, Congress also passed legislation at the behest of the beef pork uh, industries to operate, to enable USDA to operate advertising and promotional campaigns for those industries that are designed to increase consumption of, the, of those products, many of which are high in fat. Um, Mr. Waxman earlier this morning mentioned uh, meddling with the food stamp program that uh, limits the ability of states to communicate to food stamp recipients what foods they should be eating for a healthier uh, diet. Congress has failed to provide the Department of Agriculture to uh, regulate so-called competitive foods. These are uh, foods not part of the official school lunch program, but they're nonetheless sold in schools. And as we've heard uh, from USDA this morning, uh, they are not as nutritious as the official school lunch program. Congress has failed to provide USDA with authority to control the sale of those foods. And to add insult to injury, the Federal Trade Commission has developed an extensive legal and economic rationale, or apology, I should say, for why it should not regulate advertising of less healthful foods to children. In such a food environment, it's no wonder that more than 60 percent of adults are overweight or obese. Obesity is not merely a matter of personal responsibility. Let's think about it. Obesity rates have climbed greatly in the last decade or so. Now, did all of these Americans suddenly become irresponsible over the last 10 to 15 years? That would be quite a social phenomenon, to say the least. No, Americans have not suddenly and inexplicably become irresponsible on a societal level. What has occurred in the last 10 to 15 years is changes in the way foods are marketed, changes in the proliferation of less healthful processed foods, often in huge single-serve portions. What's changed is not a massive uh, uh, phenomena of where Americans become socially irresponsible, but what's changed is the huge amount of money uh, spent by the food industry a decade ago has even increased to promote unhealthful food products. 
While individuals are ultimately responsible for what they put in their mouths, the World Health Organization, the world's leading public health agency, has stated in a new global strategy on diet, physical activity, and health that was just issued two weeks ago, that it's government's role to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And I'll repeat that because it's really a key element. Government's role is to make the healthy choice the easy choice. And we're pleased to see uh, that Dr. Crawford, representing the administration who was at uh, the Geneva, Switzerland meeting of the WHO, said that the administration supports the WHO's global strategy. But let's see what it says and how it compares to what the federal government is really doing. Uh, I think the global strategy is so important that I'd like it considered as an annex to my written statement and incorporated in the hearing record if yeah, possible. Without, a, without objection, it'll be. Thank you. Well, not surprisingly, the WHO calls for educational programs. We've heard that this morning and this afternoon. Uh, that's no surprise there. But in addition, the WHO states that food advertising affects food choices and influences dietary habits and that messages that encourage unhealthy dietary practices should be discouraged. We therefore request Congress hold hearings on the ways to protect consumers, especially children, and reduce the prevalence of advertising of less healthful foods. The WHO calls for an examination of food and agriculture policies for their potential health effects on the food supply. Uh, in response, for example, USDA could develop policies to reduce the average saturated fat content of beef, pork, and dairy products instead of being mandated by Congress to run promotional product, uh, campaigns for the current product lines. The WHO global strategy uh, recommends that governments adopt policies that support healthy diets at school and limit the availability of products high in salt, sugar, and fats in schools. Well, Congress should take a look at the competitive food sold in schools that compete with the school lunch program and give USDA the authority it needs to take the measures recommended by the WHO. And perhaps most controversial, the WHO state report states that prices influence consumption choices and that public policies can influence prices through taxation, subsidies, or direct pricing in ways that encourage healthy eating and long life uh, physical activity. The WHO noted that in some countries, successfully use fiscal measures, including taxes, to influence the availability and access to a consumption of various foods. Now, no one is calling for a Twinkie tax. What my organization has called for, for example, is a 1% tax on each can of soft drink sold, one, one cent, excuse me, one cent tax on each can of soft drink sold. That would hardly be, could be called regressive and certainly would not have an effect on, on low-income consumers, but it would raise hundreds of millions of dollars for nutrition education campaigns that we all agree are necessary. In fact, more than a dozen states in the United States already tax soft drinks. It is not a radical proposition. The gist of the World Health Organization strategy is that government must take a proactive role and not merely act as a passive information provider. Neither I nor anyone in my organization is advocating that government regulate what consumers eat, but government must regulate business practices that create a hostile food environment. In sum, the blueprint has been offered to us by the World Health Organization. I am glad that the administration has supported it. It's now time that they take steps to implement it. So far, the Small Steps program by the Department of Health and Human Services, which includes such recommendations to consumers to ask their doctor about taking a multivitamin supplement to run, run running errands and to drink beer, light beer, if they drink beer. I mean, these I don't know who comes up with these kind of recommendations, but they really don't pass the laugh test. Thank there you. is legislation pending in Congress that would uh, implement some of the WHO's recommendations, and we urge this committee to take a serious look at those bills. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you. I'm going to go to questions. We have a couple of votes, and I want to instead of going over to votes and coming back, try to get through. But I've got some questions I want to move through. Um, Dr. Atkinson, just explain to me very briefly the difference between good carbohydrates and bad ca carbohydrates and how they affect the body. You need to push your button there. We evolved for millions of years as, as hunter-gatherers, and what we gathered was vegetables, a great variety of vegetables, and whole fruits, very uh, nutrient-rich. Uh, Early agriculture was whole grains slowly digested. 
Uh, those are those are basically the good car carbs. We describe can describe them as nutrient rich, as high fiber, as low on the glycemic index. When the national recommendations came for low fat, we didn't have understand those concepts. We didn't. They didn't take into account the differences. They. They. Yeah. It, but the science really wasn't wasn't there. And so what the food industry produced was all the great tasting, zero cholesterol, zero fat processed goodies, big swings in blood sugar. I got obesity. That, I got, I got and the, the timing it coincides just with that of our obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. Dr. Anderson, will you, you concur with that, basically? I think you have to be careful about You need to push your Simplistic categorization of good and bad. I'm not a good That was bad my categorization. Person. It wasn't. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the point is that even in my own studies, uh, a rapid release carbohydrate may be perfectly appropriate if you want a satiety effect short term, immediately, right. you feel better, you're hungry. Uh, the question is why do people eat too much of anything, including the rapid release carbohydrates, as well as you can overeat on a high, higher fat, high uh, other type of carbohydrate as well. So it's just, I, I think there are benefits to all forms of carbohydrate. An athlete that is at a certain time will need a rapid release. You don't want a slow release under those circumstances. Right. It's why don't people make the choice that's appropriate to their circumstance and empowering people to understand that and make those choices that I believe is important. Uh, Dr. Atkinson, again, in your uh, book, mm -hmm. you just kind of disparage the heart association's high carbohydrate, low fat eating pattern that's intended to prevent heart disease. I mean, can you just elaborate on that for a minute? Yeah, well, the, the actual studies of low-fat, high-carb, when the, when the Heart Association came out with those recommendations, they did not do a large prospective study because of the expense. They made the decision on the best available evidence. And diet studies, long-term diet studies, are very expensive, very difficult to do. And, they, and the new Heart Association guidelines are much better than the ones we were talking about uh, in, in, in the book, very acknowledging uh, whole grains and uh, what I call the, the, the good carbohydrates. And I, I agree there sometimes when you want fast release carbohydrates, but for the majority of the population in most situations, uh, it's been a disaster. Um, Professor Anderson, um, your colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor David Jenkins, developed the glycemic index concept like something like 30 years ago. Uh, as the government reexamines many aspects of national dietary policy, what do we need to keep in mind about glycemic index? Well, it's premature to put it into a public health mode. Okay. And uh, please make a distinction between diets that are geared for the South Beach or the Atkins diet or whatever it might be, and I'm not criticizing it, but they're, they are a diet aimed at weight loss. They're not aimed at prevention. We have to think about pre prevention. Now, a low glycemic index diet will assist in the control of blood glucose excursions and are appropriate for a diabetic. But the question that we have, where do these changes in diet potentially apply for the prevention of disease? Also, you have to remember that the food guide and the dietary guidance that we give is aimed at making sure people get a nutrient adequate diet as well as select the right foods to prevent a chronic disease. So it has to get both across. Okay. And that's where we're failing is in the, that educational program. Um, it's, yeah, it, the, um, you know, now we're looking at over the age of 40, a 40 percent prevalence of prediabetes and, and obesity. So what we're talking about in low glycemic foods, and there's a wealth of information on the effect of blood sugar, prediabetes, and diabetes, we're, we're talking about a large uh, percent of the population. Uh, relatively few people, if, they, they chose, if they've chosen the right parents, they can eat anything and get away with it. But we're really talking about, I think, a rather big percentage of the population. Uh, I think you know, that's appropriate. Uh, yeah, Dr. Finn. I've been in the field a long time. I've been in the field of dietetics a long time, and our dietitians uh, that represent seven, that are representative of the Dietetic Association, 70,000 of them, battle back and forth and have for many, many years about what's the best way to help people or to help patients right. that have disease. And I think the consensus is pretty much around the idea that 
you know, we're not going to come out with one way. That some people do do better on a, on a South Beach diet for prevention. Other people do better on something that might be high, a little higher in protein. And we're coming a full circle to say, you know, it's based pretty much on where that individual is. It is about calories and how do we balance those and help people really develop a healthy lifestyle that's permanent. Losing weight isn't the problem. Keeping it off is the problem. So I mean, you, you don't think government should advocate a target diet for all people. We need to no. just give them the information. I think, be, and I think you have to, as, as Dr. Anderson said, I think we have to inform people. And I think we have to do everything we can as professionals to empower people to make those choices. And that comes from all sectors of society. And government mm -hmm. is a piece of that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Silverglade, twice in your testimony, you criticized the schools for serving 2% milk uh, or whole milk, uh, which is technically, I guess, only like 3.5% fat. Because of the satiating nature of milk based uh, on its protein fat ratio, do you have evidence that the children are gaining weight from drinking milk? Uh, all I could say is that the American Pediatrics Association recommends that children older than two years of age drink low fat or skim milk. And the, there is a consensus recommendation among public health professionals in the United States, medical professionals, that children drink low fat or skim dairy products. They provide all the vitamins and minerals that whole milk provides without the unnecessary fat, calories, and saturated fat. Now, CSPI had a, uh, has a boatload of recommendations about, you know, eating and what you shouldn't eat and stuff. But through the 80s, they waged a campaign to force fast food companies to stop using natural and tropical oils for frying and instead uh, switch to vegetable oil. Um, I'm not sure, in retrospect, did they stand by that or did they have a correction in that area today? <laughs> well, I think you raise a good point. We did urge the fast food industry mm -hmm. to stop the use of tropical oils such as coconut oil and palm oil that are more uh, highly saturated in fat than, than lard or beef, or beef fat. Um, what we didn't know at that time is that they were going to move to vegetable oils and then hydrogenate them, which essentially thicken them to make them Oops. work like lard or beef fat. Okay. Uh, we didn't know that. Um, uh, it was unfortunate, but that's the steps they took. Uh, to respond to our campaign to drop the use of tropical oils. Now we know that these hydrogenated oils are high in trans fatty acids, and we are urging the fast food industry to come up with, with safer ingredients to use. Uh, French fries can be fried many ways, and in fact, in, in Europe, in the European Union, McDonald's has stopped the use of oils that are high in trans fatty acids. Why don't they stop the use of them here in this country? Thank you. I mean, a lot of this is market driven now. You go into restaurants around the country, uh, you go to McDonald's around the world, and they are uh, giving people what they want. Uh, you, have, uh, you, you have the bunless burgers in a lot of places as you, as you walk mm -hmm. in now. Uh, you have a kosher McDonald's. I've been to it in Tel Aviv. You have a meatless McDonald's in India. Uh, but uh, consumers drive a lot of this as well. And South Beach and Atkins have revolutionized a, what a lot of restaurants are offering. I would love to spend the afternoon, but we, we've got votes on it. Your entire testimony is in the record. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I can't thank you enough for, for uh, being with us today and, and sharing this as we digest it through the committee and make our report. So I want to just preserve the right to get back to you because I think w you know, what all of you have contributed is, is very, very important uh, to us as we formulate policy uh, at this level. Th thank you all for being with us. I'll let you go and we'll adjourn the hearing. on C-SPAN 2, George Soros and Howard Dean speak at a conference hosted by the Campaign for America's Future. After that, back to Capitol Hill for a hearing on the final